So we don't have a moderator, as far as I was told, but uh, we are two to spend now with you the next minutes or at least an hour. Pardon? Until 11.55, yes. Um, and the topic will be now sustainable nutrition. Of course, first of all, I would like to know most of you are students, is that true? In which semester or term you are? Third? Okay. And the others, you are interested in sustainable nutrition because you are a farmer or? Okay. So, may I ask you as well? Oh, <laughs> you are still eating, sorry for that. <laughs> so, we ha will have first um, a short presentation, but of course it's a workshop, so I would like to have a real good discussion between you, the audience, and us, the presenters of our topic. And um, the most important thing for me is when I'm talking about sustainable nutrition, that food is coming really from agriculture and fisheries. Because if you're looking now in the shops, probably you may see more the products being designed of single compounds of other products, but not being a lively food. So especially in our German uh, law, you will find nothing about where food comes from. It just says food is something people eat and it's safe for people. So it may be a solid thing, it may be a fluid or even a gas. It's called food because it's consumed. It has nothing to do with production of food in agriculture and fisheries. So that is something we would, uh, I would like to underpin. Food for me is something coming from this basis. And now I will present just roughly six different points. So for me, uh, sustainable nutrition is also linked to organic agriculture or to an agriculture which is called traditional agriculture or modified traditional agriculture but we, for instance, especially in Europe, have had this, or we still have this law for organic agriculture, so defining what is organic agriculture. And why I'm telling you that to consume foods from organic agriculture is a sustainable nutrition, because agriculture, this type of agriculture, will support biodiversity because it's also working in closed cycles, so that means the feed should come mostly from your own farm, which will, you will give to your cattle and cows. And of course, because of those uh, traditional um, techniques in agriculture, it may also increase the water capacity of the soil. You learned today that water is still a problem in the world. And of course, organic agriculture try to save energy. So here is um, a summar um, we, we summarized uh, different scientific studies about the sustainability and uh, organic agriculture versus conventional agriculture. And you will see they are mostly, um, for instance, reduced acidity in soil is better for organic agriculture than for organic agriculture, reduced climatic relevant gases or protection of resources in general, and especially reduced human toxic toxicity. That means you, because you do not use um, pests and uh, um, um, pesticide for pest control, 
um, of course, you will have a cleaner, more cleaner food. What is equal between conventional and organic agriculture is the protection of the landscape, because it's a function of usage, and the protection of soil and soil functions. Um, I think three weeks ago, I wrote an um, article in The Lancet, a very famous journal for um, scientists, and it tells you, eat the emotion, but don't trust the evidence. And what was meant was that um, going through the different scientific studies com con comparing organic agriculture and their products and conventional ag agriculture and their products, there will not be an evidence um, that there is a difference. Have you heard that as well in, your, in the States? Yeah, that is a bad story, of course, for organic agriculture. So, because I have the chair for organic food quality, uh, so many reporters ask me, is that true? Can you uh, tell us uh, what was meant by this and so on? First of all, um, by law, of course, organic production is um, to follow up the uh, production chain and then this production chain is certified. Of course, it doesn't mean per se that there is a difference in the product itself. It's just following the production. So the, the definition by law of organic food is following the production, but what people mean is that uh, organic food has a plus, so is better. The next question is, why is organic food better in the view of scientists and also for um, the market? First of all, you all have made the experience that organic food tastes better. Normally, it's not the case that it really tastes better because taste is something you have to prove on your tongue, but it's also sometimes the texture which is different, so it's more crispy. Um, so gathering or uh, collecting all the different studies using sensory evaluation, that is the, um, the scientific way to do so, you can say, yes, there are some vegetables and fruits which taste really better, so more intensive, more sweet, because they have a better balance between sugar content and acid content. And mostly, organic food are more crispy, so have another texture. You can say that is really proven a difference between that. The next step is, is organic food more healthy? Of course, you can ask um, if, if, uh, this question, but then you should tell me, are you eating unprocessed food or are you eating processed food? Normally, in our German country, more than 98% of the food is processed so not f even fresh on the table. Um, therefore, the question is based on the, let's say, I'm just buying food from a grocery shop and I'm just looking about differences in the fresh products. So is there a difference in health between those two products? Normally you say, something is more healthy when it contains more vitamins, minerals, and so on. So every positive things, like for instance, also secondary plant compounds, which, like phenolic acids, which supports your own um, immune system, but at the same time, it has supported also the immune system for the plants. So that was the question is, does, uh, for instance, organic, vegetables and fruit have more of those secondary plant compounds. And the literature tells us yes, but there are different figures uh, um, d being discussed. So between 10 and 50 percent, it depends on the variety and it and depends on vegetables or if you are looking on uh, fruits, for instance, there is a difference between organic and conventional. That is proven by literature. By the way, there was a big research project supported by our EU government with 70.5 uh, 
billion euros. And the results I'm just talking to you now, they come out of those re this re research project. You can uh, have a look in the internet. It was called Quality Low Input Food, because in those days when it started five years ago, nobody wanted to have the term of organic agriculture in a EU project. So therefore it was called <laughs> quality of low input food. And there you can download all the results I'm now telling you, so please do that, especially the students. Um, and the next point was, is there a difference between um, undesirable nutrients in, in the food which are you harvested from organic or conventional side. Of course, um, producing organic food doesn't mean you are really free from pesticides because your neighbor can spray pesticides and if the neighbor is too narrow to your own fields, there might be small residues. But looking for a longer period now, you can even say you can neglect those cases. Normally, you will not find any pesticides in organic food. So therefore, from my personal point of view and from the work I have been done since years, you can say for fresh organic produce, you can really see a difference if you compare the same varieties in the same conditions. But you can't compare different varieties, even from the same tomato, because you do have the variety counts more than the, agri um, um, the agricultural system, I would say. So therefore, my personal advice for farmers' association would be to include in their guidelines for farmers also the topic of variety, to give them some ideas which variety has the most um, amount of, or the highest amount of secondary plant compounds or vitamin C or the lowest um, nitrate level and so on. It will be more difficult to answer the question if organic food is more healthy than conventional food if you are looking for processed food. Because in the guidelines for processing organic food you will not find you will find some advice that not so many additives should be used. You will have a positive list in Europe, at least, which uh, additives you can use by processing organic food. But unfortunately, there is no guidance about techniques. So you can use processing techniques equivalent to those which are used in conventional processing. And that even would open the door, I do not say that it is now, but that it would even open the door for processing technologies like nanotechnology. So very small particles like silver will be sprayed on top of a chocolate bar, organic or conventional chocolate bar, and that will influence the, um, the melting of the chocolate bar in the sun. So there will be no melting if you have this cover of uh, silver, little silver particles on top. So these technologies can be used and therefore our, um, our recommendation for, for a farmers association and processors association working in the field of organic produce are please tell the people exactly which technology you have used during the processing and be aware that consumers have other ideas of freshness than you as a, con as a um, processors have. And therefore we did also a survey, a Delphi survey, what's called in the European countries, in 13 European countries, asking the um, processors what does it mean um, as natural as possible? What does it mean the term of vitality? So because everybody is talking about we do need vital food, but please tell me the methodology to determine vital food and what is vital for you, and so on, or what is freshness. So consumers say we are buying fresh milk, but in fact they are buying pasteurized or homogenized milk, 
So that is, has nothing to do with freshness or naturalness. So therefore we have, if, if you are going into the discussion with people about um, if organic food is more healthy than um, conventional food, please consider the different step I just pointed out now. You have to be very accurate, otherwise the people would like to, uh, to say you are not, uh, that's not true what you say. So, but because of all the other uh, uh, things like biodiversity, protection of, of water quality and so on, here the, the literature in the area of organic food quality really shows that there is a big difference in comparison to conventional. The next point is consume less meat or other animal produce. I told you already in the plenary session that um, nowadays we normally, the people in living in so-called industrialized countries are eating meat from animals which have been fed, for instance, with soybeans from Brazil or other resources. So not the case what we learned here. Here in Maine you have a wonderful grassland and of course you can uh, offer this pasture to your cows and that would be um, normal for the cows and would of course reduce the energy which has been put into the uh, beef. So these are still the, the topics I told you before. Um, just to tell you, there is of course, if you are aiming for a um, sustainable nutrition, then of course you have to decide which nutrition style you are preferring. And um, I have to admit I'm not a vegan <laughs> and I'm not a vegetarian, but I'm a person who is looking for where the meat comes and who, uh, who is reducing the meat content of my diet. But of course, if you want to be a vegetarian or even a vegan, then you have not to be afraid that you will get um, less nutrients for your, to support your own health. That was a fairy tale, I would say, which has been taught uh, some years ago to those who would like to cut down the meat consumption, that they will not get enough protein, that they will not get enough iron and so on. But there are many, many um, of the um, scientific studies done that doesn't support this idea. So the next qu uh, thing is consume fresh, not highly processed or packaged food to save energy and keep the quality. That was one of the topics you heard already here. Consume fresh means also that uh, uh, you, you are sure where the uh, product is coming from. And um, this morning I had a breakfast in the hotel and I was really surprised to see all the plastic and package, packaging around your breakfast here. So uh, tomorrow I will go here to the Mensa, to the coffee shop to have the real breakfast because I was really surprised to see what was offered as, as a good breakfast here. So then the next point will be eat regional and seasonal. Of course, one point is that you would like to, to have um, food with the highest amount of vitamins uh, and the best taste, and that means it should be harvested within the season because everything you have to transport, you will uh, harvest before it's really ripe. And that will influence, of course, the nutritional value of your food. And uh, it was normal since hundreds of years to eat more that was uh, in the region. Of course, we do need spices and herbs coming from other countries, but most of them, uh, most of our food should come from the region. And this is uh, also important because of the food culture. Within a region, you have a special processing, for instance, for um, meat or for bread and that will um, even traveling around in the world sometimes you feel at home when you eat that what is uh, convenient for you what you know when you have uh, been in your home country and have learned something about your home culture 
And very important is that food will influence also the landscape. So eating regional and seasonal has something to do with your home country, with your surrounding. And this is a picture I brought from my um, home country. So here you see a little lady telling you um, it's mine. So what we can use, it's up the line, what we uh, use in a sustainable way, we can pass it to our children and they can be proud. And here you can see the hilly areas of the Rhön. Rhön is a, it's a nice landscape within the middle of Germany. Uh, and probably you know that we have different states within Germany. So it's um, a hilly area in Bavaria, Thuringia, and Hesse. And I'm an inhabitant of the state of Hesse. So, and what makes it so uh, hilly and so nice? It's because it's really managed in a traditional way in agriculture. Here you can see, for instance, the light sheep. They are have black um, faces and a white, very woolen body, and they are light sheep. So they are really the good breed for hilly areas, not heavy sheep. And the, um, on the other hand, you can see the light cows here. And what is very special, those sheep and also the cows are traded or are, oops, going back. Um, are traded as part of the landscape with such a special um, ya logo, let's say. So what does it say? It says this beef comes out of the biosphere ruin. Um, the sheep was, or the, uh, the cattle was um, born in this biosphere reserve. It was fed there and it was slaughtered there. And this was controlled by a special company called Agrico. And um, so you can see that's really um, a product of the ruin because you do know that sometimes industry is cheating us. They are raising for, for instance, pigs in the Netherlands, then they bring them to Italy and call it palm, Parma ham. So it has nothing to do with the Italian production of, of uh, pigs, but it was really the conventional production in, in big um, units in the Netherlands and then just shipped for processing to Italy. So agriculture will influence the landscape. And if everybody will eat the same or the trade will go back and forth, then probably there might be a change in the landscape as well. Safe biodiversity, I just told you about this um, arc, uh, which you can see there, where all the products of a special region or of Germany can go into. And um, <clears throat> of course, they will be promoted, for instance, by restaurants or catering systems to say, now we are saving our food treasures, our food culture. And here, for instance, I'm um, of Witzenhausen. Our university is in a cherry region where we have 140,000 cherry trees. And um, these cherry trees, of course, are giving not only the, the right color, red cherries, but you, as you can see, we have nearly white cherries, yellow cherries, and even black cherries. And what we did from our department is also to tell the people that this treasure they have in the region, they should really keep care of it. And because normally those cherries are belonging to high cherry trees, not to the small culture uh, plants. So um, this will influence also um, the landscape by having a special view when they are blo uh, blossoming. It's really wonderful. So that is, has something to do with sustainability and biodiversity and nutrition. And then eat fair trade products. We learned yesterday that um, there are some, some groups um, dealing with the topic of fair trade, but for me, fair trade doesn't mean only, not only uh, we should look for coffee or bananas or chocolate coming from overseas and that those people are pa paid uh, accordingly to what they have done. 
but also to be fair to our farmers, our fisheries. We learned just for, um, before that it is sometimes very, um, not so easy, let's say, very difficult to, to get your own ground for fishing. Or here it's uh, in Germany, we do have now, or even in total Europe, we do have now the problem of producing milk to, um, because the, the processors are paying the farmers less than um, the money they need for feeding their cattle and cows. So fair trade has also to do something with your own farmers in your own land. And we have had a minister um, for um, food and agriculture, um, her name was Renate Künast, and she was telling us always, we the Germans are the people eating the low price food in a kitchen which has been very, very much expensive. And um, so there is an imbalance of, of all this, yeah, imbalance between what we feel what is necessary for us or the value for our body and the value outside for, for products which can be seen by other people. So we, the Germans, are really bad in that. So there are other uh, cultures in Europe that are much better, like, for instance, um, the Italian or the French, who are really taking care of the quality of their food and uh, not so much the quality of the kitchen with, where it's prepared. And um, as I told you already, the students' conference will take place in a few days where our students invited some people. Um, it's an English-speaking uh, conference, and the, people, uh, the students invited people to know something more in detail about, for instance, life cycle assessment of food. So how much energy is used to produce this or that? Or something about logistics, something about fair trade. That is, for them, very important to create their own vision for a sustainable nutrition. And my question is, what is your vision of a sustainable nutrition? Did I miss a point from your personal side of view? Yeah. I was just curious if y'all have done anything, I was just, just looking at your, the, the picture of your cherries. Have, have any researchers in your institute tried to look at the different phenolic and anthocyanin content and try to identify if there's a particular cherry in there that's particularly beneficial or is there much are they looking at any other vegetables that you're in your organization um, like we've been looking at potatoes and trying to see if there are just varietal differences natural varietal differences when we grow potatoes and the amount of phenolics and anti antioxidants and things like that to yeah. try to make people aware of it yeah, that is something we are doing also in our department because, um, as I told you before, for me it's, it's very important to give advice to farmers from the scientific side to say this variety of tomato has, uh, by its genetic uh, uh, capacity, more phenolic substances or a better sugar and uh, acid um, relation. So that we are doing, but unfortunately, um, I think they are looking not, not from the, the view of uh, nutrition on this product, but they are looking more, um, is it, how long is the shelf life? Uh, how much can we get, uh, can we get a round tomato? Um, about uh, how much can I get for this variety at the market? So. The, the, the approach from the nutritional side is not so deep from our farmer's point of view. But of course, we can offer that to the farmers, and my department especially is doing the sensory evaluation side, so we are offering them also some advice how to process afterwards this product, or if it, if it can be processed, and so on. That is uh, some advice we are giving to people who want to listen. Yeah. Uh, I understand you don't have country large labeling? 
yes, we do have country of origin lab labeling, but um, um, it, it doesn't, uh, I, from my point of view, it's not sufficient. We should go more into the regions, not um, this, this um, doc, let's say. It's more, um, it's a wider area. And I, my personal view would be to be really closer, working closer in cycles. And to, to uh, for instance, link it also with experience you have had as a tourist traveling around Germany. And you say, oh, that was typical for the Rhine-Main region, or this was typical for the Rhön, or for Hamburg, or whatever. So another topic I missed, yeah? Um, you said earlier in your speech about um, about ninety eight percent of the Germany is from Russia. Um, what level of protesting do you mean? Could could you please speak a little louder, or a person can translate? Yeah. Oh, sure. Sorry. Okay. Could you come? Yeah. You said early on that about 98% of the food yes. in Germany is processed. Um, but I'm not sure with what level of processing you're kind of referring to. Uh, like, there are there, there, like a vast yeah. um, array of different things from just like yeah, thank you. to uh, mm -hmm. make it almost unedible. So. <laughs> you are right. Yes. No, uh, processing does mean, for instance, also milling is processing, or um, heating up is processing, or even uh, to make uh, deep uh, or frozen foods that is processing as well. But it's not recognized by the consumers as being a processing step. So uh, there was a company, Iglo, it's very famous in our country for frozen food. They asked the people, uh, they had some, some packages made and asked the people, is that done homemade or is it processed industrialized or so? And uh, for instance, uh, to make a meal with frozen spinach, uh, with uh, smashed potatoes and with where you can give an egg on top, that was considered as being homemade. Although, the potatoes were not peeled themselves, it, uh, and although the spinach was not c directly coming from the field. So I think the young generation has other things in mind if they are to talking about fresh food or processed food. Okay, I think we can discuss afterwards, after um, Deb's presentation once more about all the topics, because she has now a marvelous presentation about sustainable nutrition, food as medicine, and medicine as food. And she uh, will gives us marvelous pictures. Thank you, Angelica. It's nice to hear a little bit from another part of the world that there's good work going on. So I'm actually a graduate from here in 1981. I was one of those first students, and so I'm happy to be back, grateful to Heather for organizing this conference. And for 25 years, I've been working two hours south of here in the little town of Rockport as an herbalist. I started studying the uses of medicinal plants about 35 years ago, became very interested as a teenager in where does food come from and how is food grown and how is it processed and how is it either healthy or not healthy for us. That was my beginning 35 years ago. And in that um, time period, I was given an herb book about the uses of medicinal plants. So I've sort of, my life has really followed an interest in um, food and herbs and how together they can create um, both for us as humans and for the, um, the land that we're growing our food on. So just to start, I'm going to talk specifically about plants. I thought Angelica would give it a bit of an overview about sustainable nutrition. And I'm going to focus more on specific individual plants. But before I do that, I'm going to say a few things about how I think about the, the conversation about uh, herbs and food and how that line um, traditionally in indigenous cultures has been much thinner than it is today in Western culture. 
And I just wanted to start with an, a photograph of the farm where I am. I'm on a 30-acre farm where I've been for 14 years. We're cultivating organically and with biodynamic preparations about three acres of medicinal plants. And we have over 200 plants growing, many used specifically for teas, tinctures, oils, salves, things like that, which um, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about. And we also are growing a number of flowers specifically for pollinators. And we won't really have time so much to address that issue, but for me, the issue of pollination has to be part of the conversation about sustainability. Because without our pollinators, we're talking about non-viable seeds. We're not talking about a, a future of not even having food and herbs. So that's a little bit of my work. So just to begin, just as a reminder to us that indigenous people around the world have used plants for both food and medicine. And as I said, that line has been much thinner. And, is, and around the world still today, people consider food and medicine to be very interchangeable. So as I mentioned here, the, the reason that we um, know this in the Tibetan and the Chinese and the Ayurvedic system of medicine is because they wrote their knowledge down. And those three systems are between three and 5,000 years old. And we're very, very fortunate um, all around the world, but particularly in the West where so much uh, knowledge from, from these three systems has come forth, that they did write it down. But I also just want to really remind us that the tradition of using plants for healing, whether it be as food or as for real medicinal purposes, has been an oral tradition worldwide and still is. And that's where, particularly in North America, the Native American people's tradition was written down a, a little bit, but really was passed on orally. So when I was a student here in 1980, I spent a semester living in Nepal. And this is a photograph of a young woman when I went back in 92, actually. Her father is an Ayurvedic physician. He was 86. He started his training when he was 12. And he ca came from a lineage of 22 Ayurvedic physicians. And that's just a little story of indigenous knowledge in places where it was not interrupted like it has been more in North America and other places. This woman is on the floor in her, um, next to her father's room. He, he actually would get up at four in the morning and at six he would begin to see his patients. And he would write down the prescription of the herbal teas and powders that he would uh, give to his daughter and then she would then grind the herbs and mix them and that's what you see there. So again, just to, I wanted to put the conversation of medicinal plants and healing and health in perspective in a, in a global in, and, and a reminder that as the World Health Organization says, still 80% of people worldwide use herbs as their primary source of medicine. So what has happened for us here in the West is, is much newer. Okay, who knows what this plant is? Oats, yes. So most of us know of oats because we've eaten either oatmeal or whole oats and cereal, things like that. Um, the herbal, from the herbalist perspective, this is one of the most restorative herbs that we have for the nervous system. So I'm gonna, the points I'm gonna make here as I talk specifically about individual plants is both they, they're used for the nutritive purposes, which we think of primarily as the, the, con, the category for food. But there are many, many, many herbs that, like oats, we think of as food, but they also, from an herbalist perspective, are very important. Um, in helping to really add for our health with the minerals and vitamins and other aspects, which I'll talk about. There are a lot of plants which are very effective for detoxifying the body, which is very key, um, not overdone, but key in supporting the body's own ability to detoxify. If, if we find ourselves, the functions of the liver and the kidneys and the skin are not working very well, then all the food that we're taking in is of no benefit to us. So those systems have to be working well, and herbs play that role. Tonics are lots of different herbs that play the role of helping to support um, different organs and organ systems in the body. And there are certain foods that do that, but there are also a lot of herbs that do that. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically as we talk about individual herbs. Then there's a classification of plants called adaptogens. And that term was coined in 1947 by a professor in Russia. I think his name was Laura Vez, and he was researching a number of different plants, um, particularly with people working in factories to help um, both 
improve their physical stamina and improve their um, mental capacity, their memories, um, their overall vitality. And so there's a whole category of plants, which I'll, t I'll touch on those, that really help to support the body's overall vitality. And then there are plants which are very much used specifically for medicine. And those we use for specific conditions for certain amounts of time. Whereas we might use our nutritive herbs or our tonic herbs for much longer periods of time. Nutritive herbs I would classify as like a lot of our herbal teas that we drink on a regular basis. There are herbs that we use in our cooking, um, either in our soups or our salads, things like that. But most of those nutritive herbs do contain vitamins and minerals and also really enhance all the digestive enzymes that need to be secreted to, in order for us to digest our food well. So the medicinal plants are even narrower in th than that. Those are the ones that we would use, say, if you have a bad sore throat or a strep throat or you have an ear infection or you have a mastitis, something like that. We use them for very much more narrow than the herbs we're gonna really talk about from a nutritional standpoint. And then of course, traditional people have used herbs for spiritual purposes, which I'm not really gonna touch on so much, but just as a reminder of that. So I'm gonna start with the oats. And Angelica mentioned sort of when we, the conversation about food, it's the same with herbs. And this is where I wanna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the word herbs, but again, that line is very, very thin here, and that's the point I'm hoping to make here today and that you go away thinking about is some of the herbal teas that you might drink or some of the herbs that you use, as I said, in your, in your soups or in your cooking, your salads, you begin to understand they also have benefit beyond just sort of eating something because it enhances the taste of our, of our food. It also gives some benefit. So the oats also have a very specific time in their life cycle of being harvested, and, and we find that to be true, as Angelica mentioned, just in food in general. When, an, when, a, when a plant is harvested or when an herb is harvested, it's gonna really come into play as far as its nutritional quality being of the utmost. So the, the oats for the, herbalist, for, the herbal, for the herbalist is in when they're green and milky, and that's before they're harvested for more food. It's in the midpoint of their cycle, and you squeeze, you squeeze them and milk actually comes out of it. So from an, from an herbalist perspective, we need to know, first of all, um, everything that we can about growing a plant and about when the appropriate time in its life cycle to harvest as far as being able to provide the highest quality nutrition and medicinal value for plants. So that's really lacking in the conventional herbal world, which is widespread and it's growing on a daily basis because there's so much money to be made in the herbal industry right now. Like food, herbs has become very industrialized. So this is a really important point to make about the, the actual harvesting of every single plant. And there you see a big basket of oats. We're about to do our oat harvest next week. We'll probably pick about 250 pounds. We pick them into baskets like this and then we lay them out to dry for teas. And as it said in the earlier slide, oats is one of the most beneficial herbs that we have for the nourishing the nervous system. Now think about, we, we use it down the road for, for food, very high in fiber. Also oats in its final stage has calcium, but in this particular stage, the, oat, the green oats are very high in calcium and magnesium. But particularly, I, I say to people, think about um, those of you, particularly I think about students, and anybody in a working environment which is very stressful, drinking oat tea on a regular basis is gonna to help to enhance the overall health and vitality of your nervous system. Particularly for people, I say, if you find yourself burning the candle at both ends, think about using oats, and not just once or twice. This is where it's really, as I said, that trophal restorative effect to the nervous system is when you use it day in and day out over, over several weeks or a few months, that's where you're gonna benefit from tonic qualities of oats. Garlic. Now all of us know garlic. We think of garlic as a wonderful spice to add to our food. But in, in fact, garlic, as I say here, its actions are far beyond just being able to uh, enhance the taste of our food. So it is a very, very key herb, but I'm, I'm only gonna speak briefly to the actions of, of garlic. But as far as, an, it's has a lot of sulfur compounds, which are very helpful when there's any kind of, an infection going on in the body, particularly a bacterial infection. So right now, some of you may have a cold as we switch from late summer into fall, into later fall. 
The weather has shifted. It's a lot more wind. I always say to people, wear scarves, wear hats. Keep yourself really um, warm because as we move from summer into fall, we're so much more vulnerable to colds and bronchitis and then setting ourselves up for flu and then setting ourselves up for just that kind of uh, cascading. And people never quite come out of that. And that's why we end up seeing people with just chronic colds and flus as we go into winter. So besides keeping that scarf and that hat on, think about adding garlic into your just regular daily diet, just chopping it up. We a little bit know from research that when you chop garlic and let it sit for about five minutes, that allicin content is actually stronger. And then when you put it into the end of your cooking or put it onto, onto um, some steamed greens or put it onto your salads, you're going to get more of its actual health benefit as far as helping to prevent a, a bacterial infection uh, or helping to heal. If you have a bad, you know, as I said, cold, it's particularly used for people with pneumonia. I've seen a number of people actually benefit um, using a lot of garlic to helping heal pneumonia. Also, I, I think, I hope as part of the conversation about sustainable nutrition that we're gonna be addressing more and more is um, how, are, how are our digestive systems functioning? We can eat all the wonderful, nutritious, organic food that we want. But if our digestive systems are not able to, to take that food in and process it well and assimilate it well and eliminate it well, we're already at a disadvantage. So garlic is one of those herbs that, as I said, helps to improve digestion, the absorption of nutrients, and then being able to eliminate our food well. And then that way, we're going to have less toxicity build up in the body. Garlic also, as a side point I said here, helps to lower blood pressure. And there's the garlic scape, again, one, another part of the plant that more and more people are beginning to um, eat, which is wonderful. I also wanted to address just the culinary herbal aspect, because so often we think of using rosemary, sage, thyme, savories, oregano, chives, things like that, again, just for flavor. But for an example, here, and, and you'll see this in each of the plants that I've addressed, that I talked about, um, you know, its place of origin, but all these plants that I'm addressing today are ones that I grow in my garden here in Maine. The rosemary is originally from the Mediterranean. It grows well here. And as a side note, any of you here in Maine know that we have to bring rosemary inside if you're gonna get it to winter, because it won't winter outside. But as far as also that I um, added in the energetics, um, most traditional cultures of uh, using plant-based medicine will talk about um, the flavor of an herb or food and whether it's uh, drying or moistening or heating or cooling to the body. Those all play a significant role in providing um, a healing benefit to the body. So for example, rosemary, as I said here, is warming. Now we think of it, one of my most favorite soups to eat um, in the fall when the nettles is still here is a rosemary um, nettle, potato, and leek garlic soup. Think about that for a minute. It's delicious. Yes, I can see you all. It's warming to the body. It's going to help to prevent, prevent uh, um, lung respiratory infections as we go into the seasons of more colds and flus. And as I said here, rosemary is an antioxidant. It's very, very warming to the body. It helps improve overall circulation, so cold hands and feet. And rosemary also is a nervine. And those of you unfamiliar with kind of classification of herbs. The nervines are the herbs like oats and like rosemary, which have a benefit to the nervous system. So rosemary is one of those ones I say is also a great herb for students um, because it kind of wakes up our energy a little bit. So using it in your soups, and there's the beautiful rosemary. So I added nasturtiums in here. Originally from South America, most of us who have gardens, even in urban areas, can grow pots of nasturtiums as you can grow pots of rosemary. And nasturtiums, if any of you have tasted it, you know what it tastes like, yes? Kind of pungent, spicy. So we think of, you know, we, we sort of enjoy a few flowers in our salad, but in fact, the antibacterial properties of both the flowers and the leaves is quite significant. And the nasturtium is actually in the same, kind of in a similar classification as watercress. So I say to people, don't just eat a few flowers, really think about eating them on a daily basis when you have your gardens or you have a pot of it growing or a window box growing. Um, and the leaves also, if you've ever tasted the leaves, not quite as spicy, but also very, very beneficial to promoting good digestion and stimulating appetite and also enhancing immunity. So there's the nasturtiums. I also wanted to make the point that nasturtiums are a favorite flower of honeybees and bumblebees 
and the ruby-throated hummingbird. And the ruby-throated hummingbird is one of, is a key pollinator to us here in uh, New England. And you'll see that by growing either pots or window boxes or large, um, those of you with more gardens, uh, nasturtiums grow beautifully as a hedge. You can grow hundreds of them in that way and the pollinators will be quite happy. So I, I know that n nettles is highly valued throughout the European countries. I am I'm assuming in Germany also. And when my friend comes from England, she laughs that I'm growing nettles in my garden, as probably a lot of Europeans would. But here um, in Maine, it will grow well, but you just don't see it naturalized in the same way as I've seen it. More, more have traveled in England and Ireland, and I've seen it quite naturalized. If you were to go away with one plant today, it probably would be nettles. And I'm going to talk about it um, for many reasons. It's a perennial. It will grow into probably zone four and zone three. We're here on the coast of Maine and where I am a little bit further south, we're zone five. Nettles is a hardy, tough plant. And why I, I want to include it in the conversation about sustainable nutrition is because it's perennial. It's of great benefit to the soil where it grows in. It will enhance the fertility of the soil. It's of great benefit if you add it into your compost piles. It will activate your compost and add a lot of nutrients and uh, mineral, its minerals to the compost piles. It's also one that you can make into a compost tea and you can water your plants that may be a little bit yellow and weakened. So it's a great benefit just as an agricultural based product and just in improving plants and soil, but also because it's perennial. And I think part of the conversation for me about sustainable agriculture is looking at what grows well where we are and also beginning the conversation about what are some of our food and herb crops that are perennial, that will reproduce easily, will continue to develop in ones that we can dig up plants and give to our neighbors and really spread it around. So this is where you see under actions, adaptogen nettles from the Western herbalist perspective is considered to be an adaptogen. And that actually definition is plants that help the body to better adapt to different kinds of stressors, whether they are um, environmental stressors, food or pharmaceuticals, things like that that we've taken into the body that have stressed the body, experiences that you're having in your life where stress is act has been activated. Long-term use of nettle or other adaptogens helps to strengthen the body to help be better able to just function in one's life. So that's what, where adaptogen comes in. But what I wanted to say about nettles is it's one of the most highly nutritive herbs, foods that I know of. And this is um, in the spring. It's one of the first greens that will come up, you know, tiny in, um, in late April for us here. And we, this year, because we had so much rain, we got three to four harvests. And what we do is we harvest it at this stage before it flowers, and, you, and I harvest it with gloves, and I have a little tool called a kama. It's a fantastic tool from Jap Japan. We can just lay out, screen, lay out sheets and just cut it right down to the base, and then we go and we lay it out to dry. That's for tea. You can also make it fresh in an alcohol water base for tincture, which is fantastic to lowering the histamine reaction for people with allergies. But as a food, it's also fantastic, really for, the, for about four, five, six weeks in the spring, depending on the spring weather, we can eat it as one of our first spring greens. It's very high in iron. It's very high in calcium, magnesium, and boron, and the carotenoids. So it's incredibly, along with other minerals. So it's very, very valuable as a mineral-rich green. And I want to just, as a side note, say for women, it's one of the plants that's most easily assimilated into our body for one that adds iron. So for women through their menstruating years, it's a very, very valuable one to, to be using. For pregnant women, for nursing women, it's very, very safe and very nutritious. Um, then as the summer goes on, it will, it will uh, give us flowers. And um, there's a couple things that we do. We, we, if you keep cutting back your nettle patch, it'll keep growing for you. So you can still keep drinking tea, uh, fresh tea from it all, all summer long. The only reason for drying it for tea, of course, is for the winter months. And the more tender greens uh, taste fresher for us in the, in the spring and then again in the fall months. But I wanted to say something about the seed. When we think about 
we think about sesame seeds, we think about sunflower seeds, we think about all the various nuts that, that are very nourishing to us. I hope that nettle seed will become part of this conversation. One, that they're very available to us because they give a lot of seeds. But the seeds are being researched right now for two uh, things, which is very, very key. One is for underactive thyroid. And underactive thyroid is becoming, I don't know about in Europe, but in the United States, it's a much more of an epidemic than ever before. So nettle seed is one that can be used as a tea. Um, you can add it in with your nettle leaf to help people with low thyroid. The other thing that it's being researched a lot for is to help improve kidney function. So to think about this for a minute, it's something so simple as a nettle seed. And the research is showing either three to four cups of tea a day, or some people are using it as a concentrated form, as, as in a tincture form. So I, I chose one basil out of many. Basils are very, very familiar to most of us. We love pesto, things like that. But this particular basil comes from India and from the Ayurvedic tradition. It has a long history of use in India as tea, fresh tea or dried as a tea, and being used to help prevent colds and flus and fevers and helping to resolve those situations, enhance immunity. Also, um, it's being researched right now in this country, actually, through Dartmouth Medical School, for its ability to repair damage done to the DNA, which I think is really key, especially from overexposure to radiation, and also um, its ability to lower cortisol levels. So you think about this again. The cortisol levels are elevated when we're under a lot of stress. So again, I've termed it as an adaptogen, safe to use over several weeks, over several months as a tea. Um, some people use it like in um, cooking, but I think you're gonna get more of a therapeutic benefit either using it consistently as a tea, or again, if you want to uh, grind it up and make it into an herbal extract or a tincture that's done with a water alcohol mix. The other thing about all of our aromatic culinary herbs, they all help to stimulate digestion. And what happens in that process, either those aromatic herbs or some of our bitter tasting herbs and greens, is that when you taste that bitterness or that really aromatic quality, immediately the whole digestive system recognizes that and begins to secrete bile and different digestive enzymes to improve digestion. So again, really important. There's another image of it. And I put this, this is one of the flowers of the sacred basil. All, so many of our culinary herbs that we think of are really a great benefit to the pollinators. This is one of our bumblebees and you can see that beautiful sac full of the colored pollen that you're gonna see at the little anther of the flower there. So this is one that I grow hundreds and hundreds of sacred basil. Um, we make a lot of medicine from it, but we also um, have found it to be a great benefit to the pollinators. And I, I brought tea, so at lunch, um, there's gonna be tea there and it actually has sacred basil in the tea. So dandelion also found in all the temperate zones. And when I, um, in the 90s when I was doing a little bit of research, uh, I found that dandelions are one of, and I don't know if this is true in Europe, but one of the so-called weeds that is most heavily sprayed with herbicides. And it's, I, it's probably unfortunately still true today. In the 90s, there was like, I think 36 tons of herbicides used on lawns alone in the United States, primarily to eradicate dandelions. So I, the first image here is of the flowers. The flowers are very important, they are edible. One of the ways people particularly like to do them is to put them like in a batter with milk and egg and a little bit of flour and to fry it. It's a wonderful kind of spring food. It's the first, one of the first nectar producing flowers for the honeybees and for the hummingbirds and for the bumblebees. So it's an important in that way. But what I wanted to say particularly for food and medicine are the leaves and the roots. Now many of you maybe grew up, if you were fortunate, with um, some of your older relatives who went out in the spring and dug dandelion um, to eat the greens. And if they really knew about the benefit of the roots, they also were using the roots either thinly sliced in soups or, or chopped up and either used fresh or dried in herbal teas. An herbal tea from a root is called a decoction. It needs to be simmered for about 20, 30 minutes. So I consider the dandelion to be one of the most beneficial plants that we have for enhancing liver function. So the greens are a little bit bitter. And now, of course, people are, you're, you're seeing more dandelion greens being cultivated kind of um, in the more, shall we say, fine food component to growing interesting greens. 
But just grow out and eat your wild dandelion greens that are in your gardens or in your neighborhood as long as they've not been sprayed. The dandelion greens particularly are very high in potassium. They're a very strong diuretic. They help the body to be rid more naturally of water. But the roots are very strong in enhancing liver function. Lemon balm, I'm going to go through this a little more quickly. Lemon balm, I just wanted to mention the category of the, the mint family plants. All very, very helpful for easing kind of indigestion and helping um, to just improve digestion. Also, lemon balm, particularly very cooling to the body, as are most of the mints. So in the summer times, adding our mint teas along with what we're eating is, can be very, very helpful, just keeping us more comfortable as we go through the, the hot summer. Calendula originally from Egypt. A lot of people grow calendula. I wanted to add this one in. It has a lot of medicinal benefits. A lot of people love to pick calendula. Here we are. We grow about 2,000 plants and just break off the petals and put them on your salads. Very, very helpful. But calendula, there we are picking the individual flowers into baskets and there we are drying them. As Angelica was talking about food, I wanted to say this about all of the herbal beverages. One of the key things for their quality is how they're dried. The stage of which they're harvested, the calendulas need to be picked when they're first flowering, and your fingers get very sticky, very high in antiseptic resin. But the temperature of which they're dried is key. They want to be dried between 80 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And most of the herbs being coming in from the conventional herb market are dried over 200 degrees. So they have very little benefit left to us. That's why I put that in there. They were making salve, a very, very common medicinal preparation for the skin. And I just, I added this in because we often forget that our skin is the largest eliminated organ of our body. So we want to take good care of not just what we're putting inside of ourselves, but what we're putting topically on our skin. I put this in for those of us here in the coast of Maine. The Rosa Ragosa is um, everywhere. Originally from China, has naturalized all over the islands of Maine throughout New England. One, it's very, very easy to grow, but the rose petals are edible, but also very wonderful as a tea, cooling to the body, very relaxing to the nervous system. Also, in Chinese medicine, there's a term that I think is very beautiful, that they say that when the heart is unsettled or disturbed, so when we've had a loss in our life or when there's sadness or grief, um, the Chinese say that it, um, it disturbs the spirit which resides in the heart. So roses are very, very important for helping heal the heart. And then the rose hips, one of our, origin one of our fruits here that we can nibble on, they're full of seeds, but very high in vitamin C. And there we are pouring the rose petals as an example of just, if you were to make, put any of your herbs into an alcohol water or glycerin mix, that's what it looks like. Okay, I'm gonna end just with a couple herbs here. These are the elderberries. And elderberries both are very, very commonly found throughout Europe and also here. Sambucus canadensis is our native elderberry here. And they have white flowers in early July and then they have these beautiful purple berries here this time of year. This is another example which we didn't, I mean there's so many food herbs we could talk about, but rose hips, elderberries, blueberries, raspberries, all of those have great benefit to us. But the elderberries, I just wanted to mention um, that the woman who started the research on elderberries, I believe, is out of Israel. And this was probably about 15 years ago. She start, began to research the health benefits of elderberries. Now, we know people have forever made elderberry wine, elderberry cordials, have enjoyed those through the winters. Elderberries have a lot of benefit um, for easing the respiratory, for when there's congestion and coughs, things like that in the respiratory system. Also, um, elderberries just help over the common cold. But the thing that's of great benefit, I think, right now to our scientists who are researching elderberries is they're showing that actually under the microscope how it resolves the flu viruses. And not just one, there are many, many, many flu viruses. Now, of course, there's a lot of fear about the swine flu here in this country. I don't know if that's true in Europe also, yes. And I just heard from a, a healthcare provider the other day that they're pushing the swine flu vaccination on pregnant women, which terrifies me. I mean, we think about what happened in the 50s in this country with um, thalimidide and so much um, birth defects happened. And I think, how can you push a two-month-old vaccination on pregnant women? Ridiculous. Elderberry is really the key here. Elderberry has shown to be a benefit to a lot of different viral strains of flus. So the way to use it, I would say, is in some kind of a concentrated syrup or an elixir or something like that. 
and it's going to want to be a deep purple color, and it wants to taste pretty good. And so for people who are around people with the flu, so any of you working in healthcare systems, in daycare systems, in schools, things like that, you're going to benefit greatly by using elderberry on a regular basis, maybe once a day, maybe four or five times a week. That's going to actually, what it's actually doing is that if your body is exposed to a viral infection, under the microscope, what they can see is that viruses are like little tiny thorns, and they puncture the cell walls, and that's how they get inside of our cells, and that's how they replicate. And elderberry has a number of different compounds and constituents that actually almost like disarm those tiny little viral thorns so that they're no longer able to actually puncture the cell walls. So if you are exposed to the flu, even as a preventive using it, if you come down with the flu, think about using it consistently like four or five times a day for at least two or three weeks to really ensure that the flu has, has come through, has run its course and is done. Because a lot of people stop using herbs prematurely and then, they, and then it just comes back around again. So that I'm pushing elder for everybody. And I just wanted to say the echinacea, another one too, native to us here in North America. It's a prairie plant. We have nine species indigenous to North America. Most of the research is done in, in Germany, actually, on echinacea. So we want to thank the Germans for being able to really research echinacea, again, for the surface kind of cold, flu, viral, and bacterial infections. There you see the monarch butterfly, one of our migratory pollinators, one of the key um, insects for pollinating the echinacea. And there's the ruby throated hummingbird <laughs> in a trumpet creeper, just to say, the only one we have that comes this far north. So I'm going to end with a quote by Terry Tempest Williams, science as it reveals biological understanding fosters an ecological awareness that identifies an integrity of interconnected relationships. Humility and respect follows. We recognize this indomitable web of life that plays like a symphony. So I, I, I wanted to end with this as a reminder of the ways these, the worlds of food and herbs really are interconnected and the way that traditional people and good science also are interplaying with each other to, I hope, really move us forward in a, in a healthy, better understanding of the use of how we take care of ourselves and how we take care of our planet. So I think we'll take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Organic uh, blueberry crops have uh, had many pollinators this year and yield was down in many fields. Um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on natural pollinators. Yes, he asked about the blueberry crop. And this is, it's a great question to, to speak on behalf of the honeybees because the honeybees are from Europe. They're not native here. We have 4,000 species of bees that are native to North America. And we have really forgotten that. And because the honeybees are part of the conversation about industrialization of ag agriculture. Honeybees now have become extremely industrialized. Most of our large blueberry cro uh, conventional crops here in Maine um, bring in tractor trailer loads of conventional, conventional bees. Those bees coming in are already, have already been exhausted through, they're trucked. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. So they're already at a bit of a disadvantage when they come in. I think um, honeybees also don't pollinate when it rains. And we had a lot of rain in um, May and June. I think we had, what, 20 inches of rain from mid-May until the end of June? So the honeybees weren't flying. So bumblebees and some of our other native bees are, um, in fact, should really become part of that conversation about pollination pollination of the blueberry crops. You can, um, bumblebees now, um, apple orchards and blueberry farmers can buy. So you can buy big packages of bumblebees if you want to be able to bring them into your blueberry crops. Any natural perennial flowering plants? Oh, to have fl flowers to attract it's a great question about, no one's asked me that question about the blueberry fields. There are lots of flowers that attract pollinators, um, dandelion being just one of them. I, th and I've been, been encouraging um, some of our vegetable farmers to intercrop their, you know, their rows of vegetables with some of our pollinating flowers, dandelion being one, it being one of the earliest ones, red clover being another one because you're both um, calling, you're, 
calling in the um, pollinators, but you're also fixing nitrogen to the soil. I mean, I'd be happy to talk to you about pollinators. That's a, I mean, there's so many. So as far as potentially blueberry fields, I'm wondering if on the edges they could begin to, um, you know, grow, shall we say, um, like hedgerows of some of more both perennial type, I mean, hawthorn trees are one of our native shrubs. There's a lot of different species, major flower for a number of different species of bees. So if, it's, a great, it's a great question. I'd be happy to think about that with you. Are you a blueberry person? Yeah, I'm happy to help you think about that because I have a lot of pollination information. So, yeah, yes. Uh, you were talking about nettles, and then you talked about where your goal is to harvest them. Yeah. How do you then, do you then saute those greens? Okay, great. Do you need them fresh? Um, I'm a little confused. Right. Nettles. <laughs> so many ways to do nettles. So I'll say two things. In the old European herbals, they say if you um, harvest nettles with your hands, it'll, bare hands, it'll prevent arthritis. So I do that when I do just my daily harvest. I drink fresh nettle tea almost every day in the spring and the fall. And what it is on the underside of the leaves or on the stem, it's formic acid. That's what stings you. And if you carefully make a relationship with that plant and you're harvesting, you know, with a pair of, just some pair, kind of pair of scissors, you most likely won't really get that really strong sting. When I do a big harvest of, you know, hundreds of pounds at a time, I wear gloves and long sleeves. Once we harvest it, I'll talk about it for cooking purposes. When, as I said, I, it's one of my favorite things to add into a potato leek nettle soup. And as soon as you cook nettles, it's very much like spinach. You do not want to overcook it. If you, I mean, it'll end up just basically being almost nothing in there, like spinaches. So you want to put it at the end of a soup. And you certainly want to cook it a little bit as soon as it touches hot water. This is true whether it's a fresh tea or in some kind of a soup. Um, the formic acid just wilts and it's no longer, it's no longer going to be of any adverse, you're not going to have an adverse reaction to it. So really you want to cook it in some way. So when I, the, the way that um, in the herbal world we think about our mineral rich herbs is that we let the nettles soak overnight in cool water and you'll see in the morning that the, the water will be a little bit colored. That's already begun the extraction process of some of the minerals from the nettles. And then I slowly warm it up to a simmer and then just let it infuse. And the longer it infuses, the more health benefit you're going to have. So what I usually do is I just make a quart of it in the morning and I put that hot nettle tea in a quart jar and I drink, I just kind of drink it through the morning. And if I want it to be warm again, I'll go warm it back up. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Yes. For those of us who are not living on a farm yet, how do we take our backyard in the city and do what the professor from Germany mm -hmm. is telling us to do? And how do we combine what the two of you have told us? I can answer, maybe you can answer too. From the herbal standpoint, you can grow a lot of different herbs in pots and in window boxes and in hanging plants. Is that? So all of the culinary herbs, rosemary, thyme, sage, lemon balm, all the basils, all those, the nasturtiums, those you can start out by growing in pots. Is that? Okay. Well then, Angelica. We are introducing now school gardens to our kindergarten system and also to the schools, so basic schools, just to, to get the strong relation between uh, the garden and the, the food coming out of the garden and the people. Because our German, you know, let's say, uh, children, they do not have a really strong relationship to how food is produced. Because most of us are living in cities. And therefore, we have to, to uh, use our educational system to get a relationship between food Comfrey. Um, comfrey is one I think that could be on the edges of blueberry fields. You're going to find that it's going to bring, thinking about when it's blossoming, though, it might be a little bit later when, then when the blueberries are blossoming. But comfrey, I think, is a really valuable and misunderstood herb. Um, for both small-scale gardens and farms. 
It wants to be grown on the edge. It doesn't want to be in the middle of a garden or in the middle of an edge. It could also be one somebody who had a small backyard plot in a city. You could have it in the far corner. Um, the leaves, along with nettles, are the two that I use in um, like compost teas for for watering and enhancing the health of plants. It's also a lot of comfrey goes into our compost piles when we're building. I layer it in as we're building compost piles, whether it's a small, just backyard compost pile or whether they're large windrows. Comfrey is really, really valuable. It's high in a lot of minerals and vitamins. Um, it's one because the root is so tough that you can grow it. And this is, if you ever come to visit our gardens, I put comfrey in along an area that is like a ditch that nothing else could grow on. It was a kind of a ledgy ditch. And comfrey roots are strong. And they can penetrate into areas where a lot of other plants couldn't. So they can become, again, like a natural hedge. You can grow like, I mean, you could grow a lot of it. The flowers are wonderful for a number of different bees, native bees, honey bees. The, yellow, the, um, the swallowtail that comes in May and June really loves the comfrey. And as far as medicinally, it's a fantastic plant for helping to heal any kind of musculoskeletal injury. So you've torn a muscle, a ligament, a tendon, or you've broken a bone. Comfrey leaf or root poultices topically can be helpful. And then using the leaf and the root internally for, for no longer than four weeks is usually what I recommend. It's very strong medicinally. Not safe for pregnant or nursing women and not used internally for somebody who has had severe liver condition like hepatitis or cirrhosis. But other than that, it's very valuable in the healing and repairing to tissue that's been, as I said, injured in some way. Is that, was that, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, the parents are also under a lot of uh, pressure. The, who is? Parents. Parents under a lot of pressure. To um, immunize their children. Yes. For H1N1, would you recommend the elderberry and echinacea as yeah. good preventative? Yes, I would just. She asked about parents. Parents are under tremendous pressure to be have their children immunized for the swine flu. I, I mean, I'm gonna. I'll be really blunt and say that the, that vaccination terrifies me. It's not been out. Yeah, I would use elderberry and echinacea, and the third herb that I'm recommending people use is astragalus. And astragalus is one that we can grow very, very easily here. And it's the root that's used. Um, it's What astragalus does is it actually promotes the production of a number of different immune cells that are produced in the bone marrow. So it's a little bit deeper acting than echinacea. Echinacea is a little bit more surface, has a, the body more quickly responds, the immune system more quickly responds when it's been exposed to a virus or a bacterial infection. Astragalus is one of those very deep, long activating herbs. So I've been using those three, elderberry, echinacea, and astragalus. Those three together can be used once a day, every other day, from now until spring. I would use it, the, I would use it in a liquid form. An elderberry, um, like I make it as in an elixir with a vegetable glycerin base and just a little bit of alcohol. Then I make echinacea root both in alcohol and I also make it in, echo, in a glycerin base for children. And astragalus is best used um, either in, it's a tincture in an alcohol water base, which is fine for children because it's a very tiny amount of alcohol when mixed. Or you could use it as a decoction. Um, like for yourself, if you at one point wanted to make a lot of like astragalus root, shiitake mushroom base. Um, you could cook that for several hours and then freeze that like as a soup stock and use that as a soup base for the base of your soup. So you could do all those ways in a soup stock base and as a, and as a liquid extract. So, but the, the key here is to be consistent with it, you know, at least three, four times a week. And if any of you come down, start to feel like you're coming down with the flu, as I said, the other thing I think people need to understand is for acute symptoms, you need to be really consistent every two hours until those acute symptoms subside, but then continue with those herbs three or four times a day for at least another 10 days, two weeks, if not longer, to really ensure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. She asked about autoimmune diseases. 
I would say astragalus, yes. Um, echinacea, people are using it with autoimmune diseases, but if, if that's a situation yourself or your family member is working with, you might want to actually talk to an herbalist. Um, I, I wouldn't hesitate to give echinacea maybe twice a week over several months. I might not give it three or four times a day over several months. I would use, I would back off from that a little bit. Elderberry is absolutely safe. And I would say the same thing with astragalus. You might use it two or three times a week. So you might vary, vary it in that way. But elderberry may be the, the strongest one. The other one that I'll say that we have here, it's growing right out here on the campus, is our northern white cedar. And the northern white cedar also the native people used for years and years and years for viral infections. And you might think about using that in a tincture or a tea and also in a bath. So, yes. Just a comment about the blueberries and a couple of questions for each of you. Uh, the University of Maine gave out bumblebees to some farmers this year. And for me, that worked really well. I mean, an Opscot, but we were, like everybody else, was pretty wet. But I think hedgerows, there's been a lot of research in Europe on what hedgerows can bring to any kind of fields um, as far as herbs and, and plants and animals. I think the bring back hedgerows is important. My question for you, medicine-wise, is in Chinese medicine, there is a we're in a crisis now with pollution issues in China. So it's very difficult for us to get raw Chinese herbs that are not polluted. Uh, one of my teachers, Ted Kapchuk, I just was at a conference with him, and he's been saying for the last couple of years that we have to test small batches because pollution is so bad in parts of Asia. Do you have any global thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I do. You're, it's a very good point that you brought up. One of the lots and lots and lots of Chinese herbs coming to this country are um, contaminated with heavy metals. And a lot of their agricultural practices, you know, are, are you know, very controversial in China. There are a number of people beginning to grow Chinese herbs in this country, and I think that's probably going to be the first place that, that um, we're going to feel better about. Dong Kwai is one that I still buy from, supposedly it's from a certified organic farm in China. I'm hoping that I can trust, you know, all this, the quality control paperwork that comes in with that. But I think um, both, um, there are so many valuable Chinese herbs that we don't really have um, analogs for in this country. And then there are a lot of plants in this country that are possibilities that haven't even been really used or studied. So I think growing some of the Chinese medicinals is going to be key and possibly looking for some of the ones that grow here too. There's a, there is one company called Spring Wind. Yes. And I, I buy from them and I highly, I, I feel good about what I've been getting from them. But very, very good point, and we have to be very careful. And I had a quick question for the professor. Why do you think it is that Europeans are more aware of the issues around genetically modified food? And it seems to us as, as Americans that Europeans support more local, sustainable agriculture. I mean, is, that, is that cultural? Is that education? Is that, you have a... I think part-time it's education, and uh, we, we have this principle uh, called precautionary principle from the legal point of view. So everything which is not proven to be safe should be not at the market. And I'm also in the advisory board of our Ministry for Food and Agriculture and Consumer Protection in the same ministry. And our minister also tells you that you as a consumer should have the right to decide what to buy. And gene technology, especially in, in agriculture, is a technology which does not allow on a long term that you decide what you can get. Because there is no coexistence between, um, from our point of view, between uh, gene technology in agriculture and traditional agriculture. So therefore, it was the vision of our ministry to say no, strictly no, to GMOs. That is the fact. And it's coming because we are thinking of this <coughs> principle and because we want the consumers to have the right to choice. 
Are you pressured in Germany by big agribusiness? Yes. Like we are. Yeah. 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 But somehow the public got that. Yeah, especially if you are looking then for getting the money for research done at agricultural universities, of course they would give us more money for doing research in the field of uh, gene technology than in the field of organic agriculture. That's the case. But, um, but fortunately, we also have some rich people funding research in an area which is more socially responsible, I would say. So, thank you for this question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.